Hello and welcome back. So this video is all about our electrics. We're going to continue on from where we left off last time, which was installing the solar panels. So we're going to come from the solar panel cables all the way to the finished result. I do just want to state though that I am not an electrician. This is just the result of hours and hours of research, but I do heavily recommend doing your own research as well, just to make sure. And if you're ever in doubt, it's always best to consult a professional electrician to do it for you. But with that said, I'll show you what we've got and why we've got it. So let's get into it. So we kept all of our electrics in the garage section of the van and we just covered it up with this nice towel to keep it neat and tidy. But underneath this, we have dedicated the whole left hand side of our bed area to the electrics. So continuing on where we left off in last week's video, these are the solar panel cables which come down from the solar panels. This one is positive and this one is negative. Although they're the same color, uh, they have been labeled accordingly. So the positive one goes into a breaker before it reaches this which is the MPPT charge controller. This basically takes the power that the panels have harnessed and converts it into a usable energy before sending it down to the battery bank. So yeah, the two panels go into a positive and a negative, and then out of this comes a positive and a negative. The positive goes into the positive side of your battery and the negative goes into the negative side of your battery. So here are the batteries that we have. We've got two 130 amp hour batteries and I have wired these in parallel. So the positive goes to the positive, the negative goes to the negative. Although this cable here is black, it is positive and I've labelled it accordingly just to remind myself I just didn't have another red cable of the size I needed. And coming out of the battery we have cables going to our fuse box and this basically controls or leads to all of our 12 volt appliances and uh, sockets basically. So most of the stuff we have in the van runs out of this. So with this fuse box we have ports for all the positive wires here. So for example this one here is our fridge and this will be going all the way to our fridge on a positive line and then from the fridge we'll also have a negative line and that will come onto this top part here which is the negative bus bar. You also need to make sure that you fuse your devices appropriately so that like before if there was a surge of power it would trip or break this fuse before it damaged your device or caused a fire or something like this. So this inverter here is a 1000 watt inverter and the reason we have one is because there are some devices which we can't charge on 12 volt such as our laptops and occasionally a blender. So what this does is it takes a 12 volt electricity from your battery bank and it converts it into a household 230 volts. This just means that whatever you would plug into a household socket, you can now do using this. It's a lot more energy heavy, it's not as efficient, so you want to try and minimise the amount of stuff that you charge or run from this. A final thing that I did with this is I just added some LED lights so that I could have some nice bright lights when I needed to come into the garage if it was dark. So I know all that can be a bit confusing, so let's jump into my wire diagram where I can better show and demonstrate exactly what's being used and how it's wired up. I think it's just paint a clearer picture because you can see it all laid out like that. So let's go there now. This is the wire diagram that I have drawn up for our van and I think it just makes it a little bit easier to digest what exactly we're doing, what we're using, when you can see it mapped out like this. So let's begin with the solar panels. We have two 270 watt solar panels wired in series based on recommendations from most people and from the place where we bought them. From the panels we have 6mm solar cables which came with the panels. We added a breaker on the positive line before it reached our MPPT controller. Ours is a Victron 100 over 50 amp smart solar MPPT solar charge controller. This model can accept a solar input of 700 watts. Our panels reach 540 watts so if we ever needed to we could upgrade the panels without needing to upgrade the charge controller as these are quite expensive. Coming out of the controller, we have 16 mm cables, again with a breaker on the positive wire, which lead to our batteries. I wired it so that the positive from the charge controller goes into one battery, and the negative goes into the negative of the second battery. This is just to ensure that both batteries are used equally in the circuit. For our batteries, we have two 130 amp hour AGM batteries, which are wired in parallel. We chose AGM because we wanted a fit and forget type of battery 
where we didn't have to worry about leaks or maintenance. AGM batteries handle bumps and vibrations a lot better than the cheaper flooded batteries as well. You could also get lithium batteries, which are the best that you can buy, but we didn't have the budget for those, and AGM batteries are well suited to our needs anyway. Now we don't have a large amount of amp hours, but due to the size of our solar panels, they are always topped up. We haven't ran out of power yet, even on cloudy wet days when we're stuck in the van, using the lights and charging devices throughout the day, we've always maintained a fairly good charge. To connect the batteries together, I used a 16mm wiring. From the batteries, there is a 10mm cable leading to our 12 volt fuse box via a 50 amp circuit breaker on the positive wire. It's 10mm cable because it has to be rated to be able to handle a situation where every device and socket coming out of the fuse box would be used at the same time. The circuit breaker needs to be less than the maximum current that the cable can carry, but also more than all the devices together. You really need to use a circuit breaker as it prevents the surge of current running to your appliance and potentially damaging your appliance or device or even causing a fire. Instead, the circuit breaker will trip and the current just won't be able to reach the devices. So the fuse box safely connects the batteries to our devices. The screw on the side of the fuse box are where you need to attach the positive wires leading to your devices and the screws on the top are where you need to complete the circuit by attaching the negative wire of those devices. So it completes a full circuit. You also need to use some fuse blades and these work in the same way as the larger breakers mentioned before but they protect the individual appliances or devices connected in that circuit rather than the whole thing together. To work out the correct blade fuse, you first need to calculate the total amps of the appliance and then times that by 1.25 to get an extra 25%. This means that if the electric surge beyond an extra 25%, it would break the fuse and protect the appliance rather than damaging the appliance. Then round up the fuse rated amp to match a blade fuse to put in there. Most of the wires coming out of the fuse box are 1.5 millimeters thick I worked this out by calculating the maximum amount of amps that would be passing through each wire based on the device or appliance and made sure that the wires were more than adequate to handle this. Every van build will have a different requirement for how much power is needed which will then in turn affect the battery bank and the cable sizes. So I put a website in the description to help you calculate this. If you need to find out the amps that an appliance uses then you will have to find the max current which is normally shown in watts in the manufacturer's guideline. For example, our lights state that they have a max wattage of 1.7 watts each. Since we have two sets of lights, we have to work them out separately. One set has three lights, so we'll work it out by calculating 1.7 times three, which is 5.1 watts. Now we need to work out the amps, so we'll take 5.1 watts, divided by 12 volts, because our electrics is based on the 12 volt setup, and this equals to 0.425 amps. This means that our wiring needs to be able to handle at least 0.5 amps. Then you also need to work out how far that wire will be traveling and take that into the equation to determine how thick the wiring needs to be. To work out the cable sizes that I needed, I used a very handy website here called 12 Volt Planet and they have a voltage drop calculator which I used to make my calculations. So let's take our fridge as an example. Our fridge states that it has a max current of 45 watts. So we need to take 45 watts and divide it by 12 volts to work out the amps, which in this case is 3.75 amps. So let's enter 3.75 and then we'll also make sure that it says 12 volts and the cable sizing. Typically people recommend 1.5 for 12 volt appliances, so we'll choose that and then enter the one-way cable length. Ours is six meters there and six meters back. And then we hit calculate. And as you can see, it says a drops in voltage is 0.51 and drop as a percentage is 4.25. But it says here that generally acceptable max voltage drop is around three to four percent, which means that our voltage drop is too high and it's not okay. So we're going to need to use a larger wire. We actually went overboard and we have used six millimeter wiring. So let's recalculate that here. And now it says we've only got a voltage drop of 1.08 as a percentage, which is more than acceptable. So we just use that. 
One thing that you probably have realised that I've missed out on this diagram is our inverter. And so let's move on to the next slide. Now, since we want to be able to charge and run some household appliances like laptops and occasionally a blender, we also needed an inverter. The inverter will convert the 12 volts of electricity into 230 volts, so you can plug something in that uses the household socket. This uses up a lot of energy though, and you really should minimize your usage of these devices. So what size inverter do you need? Well, first you need to work out the total of all the devices that you might be using at any one time to find out what size to get. We chose a 1000 watt pure sine wave inverter. It's much more than we need, but we wanted the flexibility of being able to add more things without needing a new inverter. Pure sine wave is a much more efficient than modified sine wave. It's a much cleaner conversion of energy and a lot safer too. It is, however, more expensive because of the above reasons. I'll attach a website where you can see what rating each thickness of cable can safely handle. The main thing to remember though is that you should always round up rather than down as if you go too low then you are potentially risking a fire. If you want a much more detailed explanation of everything happening here I highly recommend checking out Greg Virgo here on YouTube. He has some extremely useful videos when it comes to this stuff and he goes into much more detail about what cables and what fuses to use as well as why to use them. And that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope that this has helped you. If it did please give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing as you would be really helping us out. And with that, we'll see you in the next one.